Dare to Oppose Part 3 Parallel World Book 4 Written and narrated by Christine Kersey Chapter 29 Morgan What were you thinking, Mom said, after she sat me down in her room. Mr. Cunningham told me that he warned you before about disrupting the assembly. Frustration was etched in her features. Look, Morgan, I understand why you're upset about this new weigh-in policy, but arguing with Holly at the assembly? How is that helpful? I closed my eyes and shook my head as I tried to form an explanation. Then I met Mom's eyes. I didn't plan on arguing with her, but when she said we were required to weigh ourselves, it's like I couldn't help myself. I had to say something. Mom sighed. Then I made a snap decision. Mom? Yes, Morgan? Holly is the woman who, well, the other world version of her is the one who tortured me. Mom's eyes widened. I remember you telling me about some kind of torture you experienced. She hesitated, like she wasn't sure if she should ask her next question. What? I said. Can you... can you tell me more about this torture? Worry filled her eyes. If it's not too difficult, she added. Her question made me realize that maybe she didn't understand as much about my experience as I thought. I had to remember that I told her the whole story in one sitting. It had been a lot to take in. It was no wonder that she didn't remember every detail. Besides, I hadn't given her all the details of the torture Holly had put me through. Yeah, I said. I'll tell you about it. She listened closely as I explained how Holly had first gotten me to eat several power bars until I'd basically been drugged, and when that hadn't worked to get me to tell them the information they wanted, how Holly had flat out threatened me. Then I told her how eventually Holly had come to realize that I wouldn't willingly help her and her people, so she'd forcibly inserted some sort of device into the base of my skull. I didn't know what it was for, I said, but it didn't take long to find out. I described how Holly had brought me back to the interrogation room, and when I hadn't answered Fred's questions about the resistance groups, Holly had pressed a button that had sent me into throes of absolute agony. She ended up doing it three times before she... My voice dropped to a whisper as I remembered the shame I'd felt when I told them that Bryn was the one who'd brought me to Jack's house. Before she broke me, Mom pulled me into her arms. Oh, Morgan... No wonder you didn't want to work with her. She released me and looked at me. Why didn't you tell me this before? That she was the one who'd done this? A small smile lifted the corners of my mouth. I was happy that Mom understood where I was coming from. Because, I said, I knew that the Holly here wasn't the same person who had done it. Mom stared at me. Finally, she said, Do you understand why Mr. Cunningham suspended you? I nodded. Yes, but I think I should be able to speak my mind. And anyway, I wasn't really rude to Holly. I just said what I thought. I'll have to talk to your father, she said. But even though I understand why you were suspended, and I'm not going to protest it, I don't know that your father and I need to punish you further. Joy pulsed through me and I thought, Mom supports me. She smiled. Before you get all happy, let me talk to Dad and see what he says. He might not feel exactly as I do. I tried to dial back my enthusiasm. Okay. Then I remembered the campaign that Rochelle and I had started. I should probably tell you something else. She looked wary. What? Rochelle and I are trying to get as many kids as we can to refuse to be weighed. Mom's gaze went to the ceiling before settling back on me. Do you really have to keep stirring things up? I couldn't believe she was asking me that. After all I've been through, yeah, I do. She sighed. What do you think Mr. Cunningham will do when he finds out you're behind that? I shrugged. I can't worry about that right now. The important thing is to put a stop to this government intrusion. It's getting kind of scary how much they want to control what we eat and how much we weigh. Memories of my experience in Billy's world flashed through my mind like a movie. A horror movie. Terrifying, actually, I added. When Dad got home, Mom pulled him aside to tell him what was going on, 
and then the two of them invited me to come into their room for a chat. We all sat on their bed, and as I looked at Dad's face, I tried to figure out what he was thinking, but his expression was unreadable. I understand you had some trouble at school today, he said. I glanced at Mom, then met Dad's eyes. You could say that. Do you want to tell me about it? I told him about Holly's announcement that the school would require each student to be weighed every 30 days and how that concerned me. I know you don't believe what Billy and I told you, I said, but it's true, and I'm really worried that what happened there could end up happening here. He chuckled. It seems pretty unlikely that the government would make people go to some sort of government-run weight loss place. I wondered how I could convince him, but Mom spoke up before I had a chance to come up with a good response. Steve, she said, if ten years ago I told you that the government would be imposing food restrictions at school and making the kids get weighed every month, would you have believed me? He looked thoughtful, then he cleared his throat. Hmm, probably not. In fact, I might have argued that the government would never try to control our lives that much. Mom smiled. Exactly. So what Morgan told us she experienced, that the government truly controlled people's lives down to how much they weighed, could absolutely happen here. Dad's expression became serious. I suppose you're right. That's why I had to say something, I said. I couldn't just sit there and let everyone think it was okay to do these weigh-ins. I understand. He paused like he was considering my argument. It would be helpful if I could have seen for myself what happened. I thought about all the kids who'd had their cell phones out during the interaction, and I smiled. I'll bet there's a way for you to do just that. Oh? Dad raised his eyebrows. How? Some of the kids recorded it, I said. Let me see if I can find it online. Dad agreed, and we went downstairs to the computer. It didn't take long to find not just one, but several videos the kids had posted. Dad and Mom watched the videos that I found. When we finished, Dad turned to me with a frown. I have mixed feelings, he said. I understand what you're saying to her, but she could have been more respectful. Worried where he was going with that, I didn't say anything. Looking perplexed, he went on. But she seemed to bait you, too. He frowned. She even lied, didn't she? About you begging her to be in her PSA. I nodded as hope bloomed inside me. Yes, I only did it for Amy. Mom nodded. Amy had to really twist Morgan's arm to get her to do it, Steve. Hmm, he said. I'm not thrilled that you're bringing all of this attention to yourself, but I agree with your mother that your suspension is punishment enough. Really? I could hardly believe that I wouldn't be grounded. Yes, but you need to step back from this some. I turned to Mom. Did you tell him about the protest? No. Her mouth quirked into a smile. I thought telling him about the suspension was enough to hit him with initially. Oh, what protest? Dad asked, looking less than pleased. I told him how Rochelle and I had posted on all of our social media sites that the other students should refuse to be weighed. I purposely didn't mention Billy as I didn't want them to think he was a bad influence. Besides, he didn't even have any social media accounts. Oh boy, Dad said. What does that mean? I asked. He sighed. Just that it seems as if you're looking for more trouble with Holly and her group. Anxiety tightened my chest. I don't want trouble. Not at all. I just don't want the government to think we'll just go along quietly with their agenda. Dad stared at me. You've changed, Morgan. I stared back. How could I convince him that what Billy and I had told him had really happened? Terrible experiences tend to do that to you, I said. He was silent as our eyes locked. Then in a quiet voice he said, You and Billy weren't making up that story, were you? I shook my head, and my voice dropped to nearly a whisper. No, it's completely true. Huh. Was he finally starting to believe me? Chapter 30 Billy I finished straightening my bedroom as I waited to hear from Morgan. Ever since I'd known her, it seemed trouble found her. Was that something I wanted? If I stuck by her, and I had always wanted to stay by her, 
Would I be pulled into her tsunami of trouble too? What would that mean for me? I'd only just arrived in this world. I'd had more than my share of problems in my world. Did I want to start getting into trouble in this one? I heard the phone ring. Then Tasco called up to me that Morgan was on the phone. I hurried down the stairs and into the kitchen where I took the cordless phone from Tasco. Then I carried it back to my room. What did they say? I asked before even saying hello. I think my dad's finally starting to believe our story, she said. I could hear the smile in her voice. Really? What makes you say that? She told me about the conversation she'd had with her parents and finished by saying, They agreed that the suspension is enough, so I'm not grounded. She laughed, obviously happy with her parents' decision. Guess what, Billy? What? You're all over the internet. My eyebrows drew together. What do you mean? Did you notice all those kids using their phones to record my disagreement with Holly? Yeah, I guess so. Well, you were right there next to me, so you're right there in almost all of the videos. My heart started to pound. That's bad, Morgan. Why? Think about it. What if my parents see it? Morgan gasped. I didn't think about that. She was quiet a moment. Maybe they won't. I mean, what are the chances that they'll know someone who happened to post a video of us? I hope you're right. We talked for a while longer, then made plans to hang out the next day, Saturday. At dinner that evening, like usual, Tasco had the news on while we ate. Toward the end of the broadcast, the anchor mentioned Fox Run High. That's your school, Tasco said, as he took a bite of his hamburger, his attention on the TV. A bad feeling grew in my gut as I focused on what the anchor was saying. She talked about the new Healthy Lifestyles Initiative and how some people disagreed with the new regulations. Then a video of Morgan and Holly's conversation in the auditorium filled the screen. As the camera focused on Morgan standing, with me sitting in the seat beside her clearly visible, my eyes widened. There was no doubt that Billy Foster was sitting next to the girl arguing with Holly Bennett. I just hoped people would be too focused on what Morgan was saying to notice me. Hey, there you are! Tasco pointed to the screen, then looked at me with a smile. There goes my hope that no one will notice me, I thought. I tried to smile back. After all, he had no clue that this could be a bad thing. Yeah, I said. My gut churned as I imagined Billy Foster's parents seeing me on the news. What would they think when they saw me alive and well? An exact replica of their dead son. I tried to finish eating. Then I excused myself and went upstairs to try to forget everything that was happening. When I'd followed Morgan into the tunnel two months before, I'd never considered that I would be trading one set of problems for a completely new set. Although, as I considered the problems I'd left, I realized that the ones here were definitely preferable. At least now, I didn't have enforcers trying to find me so that they could lock me back up. Even so, that little niggling feeling that I didn't belong in this world poked at the back of my mind. Sighing, I lay on my bed and stared at the ceiling. The next morning, I jogged over to Morgan's house, and when Brandon answered the door and I saw his smiling face, calmness settled over me. I'd grown close to Morgan's family, and I knew they'd stand by me if my life got complicated. At least, I wanted to believe that they would. Hey, Billy, Morgan said as she met me in the living room. Did you see the video on the news last night? I asked. Frowning, she nodded. Yeah, that kind of sucks. Upset that Morgan had put me into this position, I spoke without thinking. Thanks to you. She recoiled. Wait a minute. You're blaming me? I glanced at Brandon, who seemed interested in our conversation, then I grabbed Morgan's hand and pulled her into the empty kitchen. What are you doing? She asked as she pulled her hand from my grip. I want to talk to you in private. Okay. What do you want to talk to me about? Not sure how to tell her what was on my mind without making her mad. I sighed, then decided I had to just tell her. 
I'm worried that all of the the stuff that you're doing, the arguing with Holly, the refusal to get weighed, I paused. I'm afraid all of that is going to get me in trouble. Her lips parted as she stared at me. Really? I thought you liked this kind of thing. You know, being a rebel, standing up to authority. Isn't that what Nick's group was all about? Was that what she thought? I considered the things we'd been through, escaping Camp Willemas, hiding from the enforcers, then fighting Hansen so that Morgan could get back to her world. I hadn't done any of those things by choice. They had all been done out of necessity. Didn't she realize that? Chapter 31 Morgan Why would you think that? Billy asked. I mean, I've tried to stay out of the spotlight. I pictured Billy sitting at the table in the cafeteria at Camp Willemas when I told my friends about the issues I was having with Beth the bully. When I'd asked Billy what he thought I should do, he'd said, How should I know? My motto is, Stay out of everyone's way and they'll stay out of mine. Somehow, I'd forgotten that he preferred to stay in the background. Now, as I met his gaze, I wondered if he thought I'd been stupid to speak up. Do you think I shouldn't have said anything to Holly? He shrugged, but his lips were pressed into a straight line, which led me to believe that he wasn't telling me what he really thought. Come on, Billy, what's going on? He clenched his jaw. If my... He glanced behind him, then in a whisper he said, If my parents see me in that story... He shook his head as he let his comment trail off. When I'd seen the news story, I thought the same thing. The momentary exhilaration I'd felt when I'd realized that my objections had made the news had quickly been replaced by the possible wrinkle that Mr. and Mrs. Foster had seen the same broadcast. Even if they see it, I said, what are they going to do? I studied Billy. What do you want them to do? He shook his head. I don't know. He looked away, then back at me. I don't know. Well, there's nothing we can do about it now. It's out there. He closed his eyes, then focused on me. Look, Morgan, I support what you're doing, but I can't be involved. Not right now. Though I understood, I was disappointed. At least Rochelle was in it with me. Lots of kids have said they're going to refuse to be weighed, I said. That's great. Tipping my head, I looked at him. Don't you think this is important? To stop the government from getting so involved in our lives? Yeah, of course I do. But you don't want to get involved. I get it. Disappointed that we seemed to be veering in different directions, I held back the frown that pulled against my lips. I'm sorry, Morgan. It's just that I'm finally starting to feel comfortable in this world, and I don't want to mess it up. I thought back to my time in his world. I'd never had the chance to get comfortable. The whole adventure had been like a roller coaster, one that didn't have a way off besides getting back to my world, so I could understand his reticence in doing something that might throw his life into turmoil. I pushed a smile onto my face. I understand. Relief filled his eyes. Thank you. When I was able to go back to school on Wednesday... Several kids came up to me and told me that they weren't going to get weighed. It seemed like a sizable number of students were with me on this protest, and I hoped it would send a message to Holly and her people that we weren't as much like sheep as she thought. Every morning during announcements, Mr. Cunningham reminded us to stop by the nurse's office and get weighed, but on Friday he seemed especially insistent. "'Today is the final day to have your weight recorded,' he said." If you haven't yet stopped by the nurse's office, do it before you leave campus today. He paused. I understand that some of you are participating in some sort of boycott, but let me tell you that I know exactly who is and who is not cooperating with our program, and those of you who refuse to participate will be noted. Inwardly, I smiled. I knew that many of my fellow students had no intention of going to the nurse's office that day or any other. When I met up with Billy and Rochelle at lunch, Rochelle was ecstatic that our plan was working. Isn't it awesome that so many kids are doing what we said? I knew exactly how she felt. Powerful. 
influential, like I was doing something about this. Yeah, I said. I just hope they stick with it. I thought about what Mr. Cunningham had said that morning, that students who refused to participate would be noted. What do you think Cunningham will do? It's like half the school that's not getting weighed, she said. What can he do? I glanced at Billy, but he was focused on eating his lunch, so I turned to Rochelle. I don't know. Can he give half the school detention? Not that it matters, I said. I'm not going to get weighed no matter what. Me neither, she said. What about you, Billy? He looked up from his tray. What? Are you going to get weighed? He looked at me as he spoke. Not a chance. Even though he didn't want to actively help us with our protest, at least he supported us by refusing to get weighed. I smiled at him. He'd been quiet all week, but I knew he'd been worried about his face being on TV, so I hadn't pushed him. Chapter 32 Billy I returned Morgan's smile, then glanced at Rochelle before finishing my lunch. Although I'd been worried about this world's parents seeing me on TV, nothing had happened, so my concern had begun to seep away but that worry had been replaced by a new one, one that involved Richard Tasco and his job. When he'd come home from work two nights before, he'd been excited about a new project he was heading up, so excited, in fact, that he told me all about it. At first, I tuned him out, as I really didn't care about his job, and I had my own problems to think about. But when he'd mentioned a new kind of power bar, my attention had zoomed right in, "'What about power bars?' I'd asked. His face lit up at my sudden interest. "'I'm sure you're familiar with all of the different kinds of power bars out there that people use to gain energy while working out, hiking, and the like,' he said. Although I wasn't familiar with any of those power bars, I nodded. I was only familiar with the kind the government in my world created, ones that could not only suppress your appetite, but that could become addictive and make you more compliant. At least, that had been the government's goal. Well, he said with a smile, these are a little different, more advanced, and already FDA approved. FDA? I asked. Yeah, you know, the Food and Drug Administration. That's a government thing, right? I asked. He nodded. Yes, of course. What's so great about these power bars? What do you mean they're more advanced? That didn't sound good at all. This company developed a new appetite suppressant that's completely natural and very effective, he said. But the best thing is, it doesn't add any extra calories. He paused for the big reveal. They're calling this power bar Slender Bar. So your job is to get people to buy it? Yep, that's what I do. His smile grew. Eventually, they want Slender Bars to be available in the schools, which would be a gold mine. His face became serious, the face I remembered on TV telling the world that he'd managed to capture Morgan Campbell. Obesity is a real problem in children nowadays, he said, but with a slender bar there's a way to help children get the nutrition they need without all the calories, and as a bonus, it will keep them from feeling hungry for hours afterward. A chill raced up my spine. He was already sounding like a commercial. I've got a lot of work to do, he said. I'll be in my office. I'd watched him leave. Then I'd stared at the wall as my thoughts had spiraled in a million different directions. I'd considered calling Morgan, but I'd known she would freak out, so I'd kept the information to myself. Now, as I sat with her and Rochelle at lunch, I couldn't keep this to myself any longer. I listened to them talk about the protest, their classes, and other things before I finally spoke up. Hey, Morgan? She looked at me in surprise, almost like she'd forgotten I was there. Yeah? I glanced at Rochelle before zeroing in on Morgan. I found something out that I think you'll be interested in. Really? What? Turns out the Tasco is working on a new ad campaign, a campaign for a new kind of power bar called Slender Bar. Her eyes widened, and I knew she was catching on to the significance of this. 
So, Rochelle said, what's the big deal? When I met her eyes, I realized her attitude was a microcosm of society as a whole. The way she felt would be how most everyone else would feel, so getting her reaction would actually be helpful. He said it has a new kind of appetite suppressant in it, one that's all natural and doesn't add any extra calories. That's great, Rochelle said with a smile. I turned to Morgan and saw that her attitude was exactly the opposite of Rochelle's. What do you think, Morgan? I think it's terrible. Why? Rochelle asked. If we can eat something that will help us not be hungry, that would be great. Confusion clouded her eyes. How could that possibly be a bad thing? How do we know what's really in them? Morgan asked. What do you mean? They're not going to put anything in them that's bad for us. Morgan glanced at me before facing Rochelle. How do you know that? These are the same people that want to tell us what to eat and want to know our weight every month. What would keep them from putting something in the power bars to control our behavior? Rochelle shook her head. Morgan, now you're starting to sound like one of those conspiracy people. Like you think the government is out to get you. She laughed. It's not like they're going to make you eat these power bars or anything. Tasco said they want to get them into the schools, I said, as I remembered his obvious excitement at the prospect. What? Morgan said, her voice sharp. I grimaced. That's what he told me. Our parents wouldn't allow that, Rochelle said. Morgan narrowed her eyes at Rochelle. Why not? I mean, they don't seem to care about the other changes taking place. Rochelle looked less certain of her stance now. Yeah, I guess. She paused. What can we do about it anyway? So, you agree that these slender bars are a bad idea? Morgan asked. At least in the schools, Rochelle said. The bell rang, and we left the cafeteria to go to our classes. As soon as the teacher took roll, he read off a list of names, including mine, and told us to go to the nurse's office to be weighed. As I followed the handful of students out of the room, I stayed quiet as I listened to them talk. Are you going to get weighed? The girl in front of me asked her friend. I don't want to get in trouble, the second girl said. I don't either, the first girl said. But I don't want to do this. It's none of their business how much I weigh. This whole thing is stupid, the boy who led the way said. What do they care how much we weigh or what we eat? A few minutes later, we were lined up outside the nurse's office with about a dozen other kids. I didn't see Morgan among them and wondered if she'd been called to the nurse's office as well. I watched as one kid after another went into the nurse's office, the door closed, then a few minutes later the kid came out. Some kids were frowning when they came out and others were smiling. When I reached the front of the line, the nurse held the door to her office open and I walked in. Besides a desk tucked in a corner, there was a bed along one wall and a scale against the back wall. What is your name? The nurse asked as she slid into the seat at her desk. Billy Foster. She typed that in, then looked at me with a smile. Please step on the scale, Billy. I stared back, but didn't move. Even though I didn't relish the idea of getting into trouble, I was in complete agreement with Morgan that it was none of the government's business how much I weighed. Go on she urged. No, I said. I'm going to pass. She sighed, then stood. I know some of you don't want to be weighed, but it's mandatory. I shook my head. She sighed again. This will mean a week's detention, Billy. So I would get in trouble. The nurse stared at me, her face questioning like I might change my mind. I shook my head again. I'm not going to do it. Fine, you may be excused. As I left her office, I marveled that I hadn't had to worry about enforcers barging in to drag me away. In my world, there would have been no question. I would have been weighed. No arguments, no detention. Just do it or else. I'd refused, and I'd lived to tell about it. A smile blossomed on my lips as I headed back to class. Chapter 33 
Morgan. I'd heard rumors the kids were being taken out of class to be weighed, and I wondered when it would be my turn. Had Billy already been pulled in? Had he refused? What would happen to the kids who said no? When it was time to go to health, my last class, and the class I had with Billy, my heart began to pound. The school day was coming to a close, and I had yet to talk to Mr. Cunningham or the nurse. As strongly as I felt about not being weighed by the school, I was nervous about the consequences. As I sat in my seat and waited for Billy to arrive, I crossed one leg over the other and jiggled my foot, trying to release my nervous energy. "'Hey, Morgan,' Billy said as he sat beside me. I turned to him. "'Hey, have you gone to the nurse's office? I heard they're taking kids out of class.' He nodded. I stared at him. "'What happened?' He told me how he'd refused to be weighed, and now he would have to spend a week in detention. "'Oh, that's not too bad, I guess.' He shrugged. "'I guess not.' The teacher started class, and after taking roll, she told me and two other kids to go to the nurse's office. This is it, I thought. I smiled tentatively at Billy, then got up and headed toward the door. I glanced at the two girls walking with me and said, You're not going to let them weigh you, are you? The girls looked at each other, then turned to me. Uh, I don't know, one of them said. No way, the other said at the same time. Just before we reached the nurse's office, where there was a short line, I said, Stay strong. They looked at me funny, like I was being overly dramatic, but I just smiled as I got in line and they stood behind me. When it was my turn, the nurse asked my name, then told me to get on the scale. My weight is none of your business, I said. Her eyebrows rose. Miss Campbell, Mr. Cunningham warned me about you. What did that mean, I thought. He told me to send you to see him if you refuse to be weighed, she said. Surprised she didn't just tell me I'd have to go to detention for a week, like she'd told Billy, I stared at her. Go on, she said. I turned and left her office, but I had no interest in talking to the principal, so instead I went back to class. Defying the principal like that was not something the old Morgan would have ever done, but I had changed and I believed I'd done nothing wrong. There was no reason for me to be singled out. At least that's what I told myself. Back already? Billy murmured to me when I slid into the seat next to his. I just smiled tightly, then faced the front to listen to the teacher's lecture. The moment class ended, I turned to Billy with a frown and told him what had happened. He put his books in his backpack. I wonder why he wants to see you. I shrugged like I wasn't worried, but inside I was concerned. We left the classroom, but before we could exit the building, Mr. Cunningham intercepted me with a frown. Morgan, the nurse told you to come see me. I didn't want to miss class, I said. Hmm, well, I'd like to talk to you in my office now. I glanced at Billy. I'll wait for you outside, he said. I nodded, then followed Mr. Cunningham to his office. After we were seated, he tapped his fingers on his desk as he stared at me. I've spoken to a number of students who refused to be weighed, he began. When I asked them why they were refusing, guess what almost all of their answers had in common? Uh-oh, I thought. This couldn't be good. That they believe their weight is no one's business? I said. Nope. They said they were part of an organized boycott, organized by you, Morgan. He leaned back in his chair. The leather creaked in protest. What do you have to say about that? I'd been nervous about having this conversation with the principal, but now that I was sitting in his office, I wasn't scared at all. I'd say that they're old enough to make up their own minds about what they want to do. With a little nudge from you, of course. I shrugged. There's nothing illegal about making a suggestion. A suggestion to break a rule, he said as he leaned forward. A rule that shouldn't exist, I shot back. Mr. Cunningham's jaw clenched as he narrowed his eyes. I think it's time I invited your parents in for a chat. Great, I thought. Even though I knew my parents understood my point of view, I wasn't certain that they would support me in my attempt to oppose this new rule. 
Please wait outside of my office, he said. I held back a sigh, then left his office and sat in one of the chairs just outside his door. He closed his door so I couldn't hear his side of the conversation with whomever he was calling. I thought about the fact that I was being singled out, even though Rochelle had been as involved as I was with organizing the refusals. Surprisingly, that didn't upset me. Not only would it not have helped me if she was also in trouble, but if she was kind of a secret organizer, then even if I was in trouble, she could keep things going behind the scenes. A few minutes later, Mr. Cunningham poked his head out of his office. Your mother will be here shortly. Can I tell my friend that I'll be a while longer? I asked. He's waiting for me in front of the school. Yes, but come in with your mother. I nodded, then left to find Billy. Like before, Rochelle was waiting with him. What did he say? Billy asked. He called my mom, and she's on her way here, I said. That's not good, Rochelle said. I know, I said, then thought, at least I would be able to intercept her before we went into the principal's office. Did you get called into the nurse's office? I asked Rochelle. Yeah, she smiled, and I refused to be weighed. Got detention, too. She seemed so proud of herself that I couldn't help but laugh. Good. I guess we'll find out how many other kids refused when we go to detention on Monday, Billy said. Yeah. Would I be in there with them, or would I be suspended? We talked about other things until I saw Mom pull up. I headed toward her car and met her as she started up the walkway to the building. I'm not thrilled to be here, she said with a frown as she walked beside me. I'm sorry he called you, Mom. She sighed. Morgan, I know you feel very strongly about this, but how far are you willing to go to change things? I stared at her. As far as I have to. Chapter 34 Morgan When we reached Mr. Cunningham's office, he invited us in. I'm sorry I had to interrupt your Friday afternoon, Mrs. Campbell, he said as he closed his door. He gestured to the pair of chairs in front of his desk. Please have a seat. After all three of us were seated, Mr. Cunningham glanced at me before focusing on Mom. Like I told you on the phone, Morgan has admitted to instigating misbehavior by a number of our students. I hadn't admitted to anything, and I wanted to object to his claim, but decided it was best for me to keep quiet. Were you aware of your daughter's involvement in persuading the other students to refuse to participate in the weight study, Mrs. Campbell? Weight study? That was the first time I'd heard it called that. Mom shifted slightly in her seat, and I waited to see what she would say. I had told her what I was doing, and she hadn't told me not to do it. Are we here to talk about me or about my daughter? Mom asked. Mr. Cunningham stared at her obviously surprised by her refusal to answer. I'm concerned about Morgan's unwillingness to follow the school's rules. She doesn't seem to understand that without rules, we would have anarchy. What rules has she broken? Mom's direct question seemed to fluster Mr. Cunningham. Well, the new rule to be weighed once a month. I'm sorry, but can you explain to me how breaking that rule would lead to anarchy? I wanted to hug Mom as I bit my tongue to keep from smiling. Mr. Cunningham cleared his throat. It's not that specific rule that's the problem, Mrs. Campbell. Rather, it's Morgan's attitude that she doesn't have to follow the same rules as everyone else. I see, Mom said. Then she paused as if considering a difficult problem. What if a student strongly disagrees with one of your school's rules? What recourse would that student have? I assume you're talking about Morgan's refusal to be weighed. Yes. You may not be aware, Mrs. Campbell, but you can choose to opt Morgan out of the monthly weigh-ins. My mouth fell open. No one had ever mentioned that before. Did they not want anyone to know? Mom glanced at me. Then I would like to do that. Mr. Cunningham produced a sheet of paper as if he'd been prepared for this exact outcome and handed it to Mom. Mom quickly read it, then filled in the blanks and signed it. Though that meant I was off the hook for being weighed, what about the other kids? Obviously, I would need to let them know they could opt out, 
but I knew that many kids would still be weighed every month. Here you go, Mom said, as she handed the principal the signed opt-out form. He took it from her. The students who chose to disobey the new weigh-in rule without having a signed opt-out form will be required to attend detention all next week, he said. That will include your daughter. But I just signed a form to opt Morgan out. Yes, but that was after this week's weigh-in. If you'd signed the form before today, then she wouldn't have been required to be weighed. Not able to listen in silence any longer, I said. You never told us about being able to opt out. I'm sure I announced the opt-out option this week, he said. Perhaps it was on one of the days you were suspended. Narrowing my eyes, I frowned. That could be true, although neither Billy nor Rochelle had mentioned it, so that didn't seem likely. Even so, I wasn't prepared to call him a liar to his face. In any case, he said, as he focused back on Mom, as the one who instigated the protest, or whatever they're calling it, Morgan will be disciplined further. What? I thought. I squeezed my hands against my thighs to keep from speaking out again. Mom would not appreciate that. However, he said, rather than disciplining her directly, I'd like to offer Morgan the opportunity to pay restitution by giving of her time. What did you have in mind? Mom asked. Mrs. Bennett has requested that Morgan participate in an additional public service announcement. This was too much. No, I said. I won't work with her. Mr. Cunningham smiled at me, but it didn't reach his eyes, and I knew he'd about had it with me. It's not up to you, Morgan. Mom put her hand on my arm, but stayed focused on Mr. Cunningham. What if my husband and I don't give permission for this? He sighed. Why would you do that, Mrs. Campbell? Don't you agree that Morgan needs to behave while at school? What other options do we have? Mom pressed, ignoring his question. There are no other options for restitution. However, there's always the option of moving her to another school. Another school? I'd barely begun to feel comfortable at Fox Run High. I had no desire to start over. Not only that, but Billy would still be at Fox Run. Mom removed her hand from my arm and sat up straight. Move to a different school? You're not serious. Absolutely. I won't have one of my students causing trouble for the entire school. We tried suspension. Twice now. Clearly, that didn't make a difference. Perhaps Morgan would benefit by being in a different environment. Did she really cause that much trouble? Mom asked. Due to her encouragement... Twenty percent of my students refused to be weighed. A smile blossomed on my mouth. Twenty percent? Awesome. Mr. Cunningham frowned at me, so I got my expression under control. Now I'm going to have to contact all of those parents, he said, as well as have extra teachers stay after school all week to oversee the students' detention. Yes, he said with a stern look. She really did cause that much trouble. I almost blurted out that he should make sure and tell the parents that they could opt out, but I would tell the kids myself. If Morgan does the PSA, Mom said, that will be the end of it. She can continue attending Fox Run? She'll still need to attend detention next week with the other students, of course, but yes, she will be allowed to continue attending school here. I'll need to discuss this with my husband. Mr. Cunningham took a card from his desk and held it out to Mom. Please call me as soon as you've made a decision. My cell number is on the card. Thank you, Mom said, although I wasn't sure what she was thanking him for. Let's go, Morgan, she said. Then she stood and turned toward the door. Mr. Cunningham stood as well. Thank you for taking the time to come talk to me. Mom stopped and looked at Mr. Cunningham. My daughter's well-being is my top priority, and I'll do what I believe is best for her. Mr. Cunningham seemed taken aback by Mom's words as well as her tone, and I held back a smile as I felt her unwavering support for me. Goodbye, she said with a smile. Then she left the office with me trailing after her. The moment we cleared the office, I opened my mouth to speak. Not now, Morgan, she said, cutting me off, although she hadn't even seen me open my mouth. I guess she just knew I would have something to say. 
I didn't understand why she suddenly sounded angry, but I kept my thoughts to myself as we walked out of the building. I saw Billy and Rochelle waiting for us, and I headed toward them. You need to come home with me, Mom said. Can I tell them goodbye? Mom looked at me with a frown. You have three minutes. I'll be in the car. Okay. As Mom walked toward her car, I hurried over to Billy and Rochelle. I only have a minute, I said. Then I told them what had happened. We can opt out, Rochelle said. The news clearly new to her, too. So you guys never heard him say that you could, I asked. They shook their heads. He was lying when he said he announced it, I said. Then I paused. We have to make sure everyone knows they can opt out. I'll start posting that right away, Rochelle said. Mom honked the horn. I have to go. Billy pulled me in for a kiss, and I was suddenly in no hurry to leave. He released me with a smile. You'd better go. I grinned, then nodded. A moment later, I climbed into the car. Thanks for standing up for me, I said to Mom, as we pulled out of the parking lot. I didn't want to make her any angrier, but I wanted to get a conversation going. I'm not happy with you, she said. That was obvious. What do you want me to do? She sighed. I don't know, Morgan. I need to talk to your father. Okay, but I really don't want to do another PSA. Mom glanced at me. So you'd rather go to a different school? Of course not. Then I don't see how you have a choice. We drove in silence. Then I remembered Billy's revelation about the ad campaign for Slender Bars. Glancing at Mom, I saw her mouth pressed in a straight line and decided I would ask Dad directly about his firm's new ad campaign. When we got home, Mom shut off the engine and turned to me. I'm not happy about having to argue with the principal of your school, Morgan, even though I understand why you did what you did. She looked at me with confusion. You really didn't know you could opt out? I shook my head. He never said anything about that. I even asked Billy and Rochelle, and they'd never heard that either. Hmm. Well, regardless, you must know that Dad and I can't keep the school from meeting out whatever punishment they feel is justified. With a grim look, she continued including making you do the PSA with Holly. Chapter 35. Morgan. The tick, tick, tick of the cooling engine filled the silence as I contemplated Mom's words. If I had to do the PSA with Holly, what would she make me say? What would she make me do? There's got to be some other way, I said, although I had no idea what that other way could be. Mom reached for her door. Let me talk to your father. Maybe he'll have an idea. When we walked into the house, Zack and Brandon were throwing the couch cushions at each other, and Amy was standing with her hands on her hips, obviously frustrated with our brothers. That's enough, Mom said, her voice sharp. Put the cushions back on the couch. She turned to Amy. Thank you for watching them, honey. They're little monsters, Amy said. Then she turned and went up the stairs. Mom looked at me with a frown, and I knew she wasn't happy that she'd had to drop everything to come to my school. I half shrugged. What else could I do? You're on dinner duty tonight, Mom said, obviously knowing exactly what I could do. And dishes. About to protest, I opened my mouth, but at the look on Mom's face, I quickly closed it. Yes, she supported me, but I was still making her life difficult. Okay. When Dad got home, Mom immediately dragged him upstairs, and I wished I could be a fly on the wall to hear that conversation. Instead, I stayed in the kitchen and put together a casserole that Mom had planned for that night. All through dinner, I nervously glanced at Mom and Dad, wondering what they had talked about, but I knew they were going to make me wait. Finally, after hurrying through doing the dishes, I walked over to Mom, who was sitting on the couch reading, and tapped her on the shoulder. She looked at me with a smile. I raised my eyebrows as if to say, Well? What is it, Morgan? She asked, like she had no idea what was on my mind. I glanced at my brothers, who were immersed in a movie. Did you talk to Dad? She placed her favorite bookmark between the pages of her book, set the book on the coffee table, then turned to me. Yes, I did. Are you done in the kitchen? Intensity washed over me, and I nodded. Good. 
Then let's see if Dad is available to talk. Mom stood, then walked to the computer where Dad was working. She set her hand on his shoulder. Steve? He looked up at her, then glanced at me. Ready? She nodded, and I worried. They'd obviously discussed what had happened. I was the only one in the dark. Let's go up to our room, he said, and the three of us trooped up the stairs and into the master bedroom. I'd been spending way too much time in here lately, time when I'd been the center of the conversation. Have a seat, Morgan, Dad said, as he gestured to the foot of their bed. Perched on the edge of the large bed, I pressed my palms into the soft fabric of the comforter as I waited for their verdict. Dad stood directly in front of me with Mom by his side. Mom told me about her conversation with your principal, Dad began. I can't say that I'm completely surprised about what happened. After all, you did tell us that you were organizing this protest. His lips pressed together. But, Morgan, you were just suspended earlier this week, and now Mr. Cunningham is talking about kicking you out of Fox Run to go to some other school. He stared at me. I know you have some, he tilted his head, extenuating circumstances, but that doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want. I know that, I said, but he held up his hand, and I pressed my lips together. You may believe that your school is overstepping its bounds by forcing each student to be weighed, I nodded vigorously, and you may believe that Mr. Cunningham is being unreasonable by telling you that you have to either do the PSA with Holly Bennett or go to another school, but the fact is, he has the authority to make that decision. But that's not right, I said, not able to stay quiet any longer. I shouldn't get kicked out of school for standing by my beliefs. That may be true, Dad said, but it's also true that Mr. Cunningham gave you a choice. He stared at me. It's up to you now. So I have to either do the PSA with Holly, I glanced at Mom, since she knew why I objected to that, or change schools? It looks that way, he said. Mom also told me about this opt-out thing and how you hadn't known about it. Yeah, I think he didn't want anyone to know. I don't see anything wrong with letting your friends know about it. Believe me, I said. I'll be letting them know. At least that was one positive thing I could do. Okay, Dad said. The conversation obviously over, I stood. But then I remembered the slender bars. Dad? Yes? Billy told me that Mr. Tasco is working on an ad campaign for something called Slender Bars. Do you know anything about that? Uh, he said. Then he glanced at Mom. Yeah. Mom stared at Dad, her forehead creased. They're a new client, he said. Do you know that these power bars have an appetite suppressant? I asked. Dad nodded. Mr. Tasco told Billy that they want to eventually get them into the schools, I added. What? Mom said her voice showing alarm. Give them to our children? Dad rubbed the back of his neck. I don't know that that will happen. Steve, don't you remember what Morgan told us about those power bars she had to eat? I knew Mom remembered the details because I'd so recently told her about my experience with Holly and how she'd waited until I was basically drugged from the power bars before she'd questioned me about the resistance groups. Not really, Dad said. The power bars Billy and I ate were required to eat, also had an appetite suppressant in them, I said. All the kids at school ate them, but the power bars in the fat center also had some sort of drug in them that made them addictive, and another drug that was supposed to make us compliant. Dad looked surprised, like this was the first he'd heard of this. The slender bars don't have anything like that. That you know of, I said, although I didn't actually believe they had anything so nefarious as addictive drugs in them but that wasn't the point. The point was the direction we were headed with these bars, especially if the goal was to have everyone eating them, even school children. I sank onto the bed as I mentally listed all of the changes in this world related to weight. The new junk food regulation, the weigh-ins at school, the PSAs trying to change the way people thought about health, and now these slender bars... Could my world actually be headed down the same path that the alternate world had already gone? I think you're overreacting, Dad said. Are you working on this ad campaign too? Mom asked. Yes, Richard and I are both on the Slender Bars team. 
Not only had Dad known about the power bars, I thought, but he'd been actively working on the ad campaign? Can you drop this client? Mom asked. No, Dad said without hesitation. They're one of our biggest clients. Maybe you could get off the team, I suggested. Dad looked at me like I had no clue. Working on this campaign is important to my career, Morgan. I can't just say I don't want to do it. So, I said, you try to get people to buy these slender bars, even if you knew they could end up in our schools, where your children would be eating them? It's unfortunate that you don't like what I'm doing, he said, but I have to support our family. I could see that my words weren't swaying him at all. Fine. Can I go now? Yes, but you need to make a decision by Monday morning. Do the PSA or change schools. I hated my choices. Fine. Mom wrapped her arms around me, and I let myself be comforted by her warmth. Even though I was unhappy with Dad's decision to work on the Slender Bars campaign, I still loved him and Mom, and I didn't want to stay mad at him. After Mom released me, I gave him a hug as well. Chapter 36 Billy Come see what you think, Tasco said, after he had been working in his office for an hour. After Morgan had left with her mom after school, Rochelle had dropped me off at home, and I'd worked on homework until Tasco had gotten home. He'd been eager to work in his office, so he'd ordered pizza again, which was fine with me. After dinner, I'd cleaned the kitchen, then I'd gone back to my room, and that's where he found me. Yeah, sure, I said, as I followed him to his office. He slid into his desk chair and pointed to his monitor. This is what Steve and I have come up with for the Slender Bars campaign so far. Wait, I said. Morgan's dad is working on this too? With a look of mild surprise, he said, Well, yeah. Did Morgan know about this, I wondered? Must not. Otherwise, she would have mentioned it to me. Pushing down this new concern, I focused on Tasco's screen. It's still a work in progress, he said but I wanted to get your take on it. He turned to me with a smile. Kids your age are the primary market. His words chilled me. High school kids had been one of the main groups that ate the power bars in my world. All of a sudden, I didn't want to see his ad campaign anymore. What do you think? He asked. Yeah, it's great, I said, my voice lacking any enthusiasm. He frowned. You could try a little harder to give me feedback, Billy. It's the least you could do after all I've been doing for you. There was no doubt that I appreciated all he'd been doing for me, taking me in, feeding me, making me feel at home. But I couldn't lie about this. Sorry, I muttered. Then in a stronger voice, I'm just not a big fan of power bars. Oh, why not? Clenching my jaw, I tried to think of a good response. In my experience, they cause more problems than they help. He turned in his chair so that he fully faced me. Really? Why? He grinned. Getting your take on this could be helpful to my campaign. I didn't want to do anything to help him with this stupid ad campaign, not if it led to anyone actually buying Slender Bars. He must have sensed my reticence. Come on, Billy. Tell me why you don't like Power Bars. As I appraised him, I wondered if I could somehow sway him to not do this campaign at all. Do you want the truth? He nodded, obviously eager to get the opinion of his target market. Okay. The power bars I've had, ones that also included an appetite suppressant, turned out to make people sick. As I spoke, a crease formed between Tasco's eyes, and it deepened as I continued my explanation. In fact, I went on, if I could, I would do anything to stop those power bars from even being on the market. Who do you think you are? He asked as anger clouded his eyes. You're just some teenage kid. What do you know about what should or shouldn't be on the market? His eyes narrowed. What's the name of the power bars you're talking about? I'm not familiar with any other power bars that have an appetite suppressant. That information surprised me. I'd assumed that such a thing existed in this world, too. Could slender bars be the first of its kind? That seemed even worse. It was too much like my own world. I don't remember what they're called, I said. I think you're lying. He shook his head. Why would you lie about that? That doesn't even make sense. I'm not lying. 
The idea of lying was repellent to me. I'd done some things I wasn't proud of, but I'd always tried to be truthful. Sure you are. He laughed like he was relieved to have figured out my secret. No other power bars like slender bars exist, so you have to be lying. He faced his computer, turning his back to me. Slender bars are completely unique. His phone rang and he snatched it off its cradle. Hello? He paused. Yeah, he's right here. He looked at me. It's Morgan. I took the cordless phone from him, glad he wouldn't be able to pick up his extension to listen in, then carried the phone to my room. Hey, I said. Billy, I need to talk to you. Urgency filled her voice. What's up? My dad is working on that Slender Bars ad with Tasco. I sighed. I know. I just found out from Tasco. I asked him not to do it, but he wouldn't listen to me. Really? Even after everything we've told him? Yes. I told her about my conversation with Tasco. You called just in time, I said. It gave me an excuse to leave his office. I can't believe he called you a liar. She laughed. Scratch that. I can totally believe he called you a liar. This is Richard Tasco we're talking about. Not so different from the Tasco we knew after all, perhaps. I didn't want to believe that. I wanted to believe that depending on the circumstances, people could be different, better. So it looks like I might have to do another PSA with Holly. Her voice was resigned. What? Why? It's punishment for getting everyone to refuse to be weighed. Cunningham said if I don't, I'll have to go to another school. That's not right. Even in this world, people manipulated other people to get what they wanted. Chapter 37 Morgan So, Dad said Sunday night, what'd you decide? Are you going to do the PSA? I'd put off thinking about it, but from the start I'd known I'd have to do the PSA. Changing schools was not an option. No way did I want to go to school without Billy, or have to start over. Yeah, I don't think I really have a choice. Dad nodded. Okay, then. We'll call your principal in the morning and let him know your decision. What about you? I asked. Me? What about me? Have you changed your mind about not working on the Slender Bars ad campaign? He laughed. Why would I do that? Dad... My voice showed my unhappiness. You know how I feel about it. Placing his hands on my shoulders, he spoke in a soft voice. Morgan, believe it or not, it's not all about you and what you want. Sometimes there are other things to consider. I know that, Dad. And for the record, this isn't about me. It's about our society getting so obsessed with weight that they'd be willing to eat these slender bars that have a drug in them. Dad let go of my shoulders as he stood up straight. A drug? What do you mean? The appetite suppressant. It's some sort of drug, isn't it? It's all natural. It's not natural to stop ourselves from being hungry, except through eating. Yes, we can choose healthy food, but that's how we should stop our hunger. Not by eating some manufactured product that tricks our brain into thinking we're not hungry. He stared at me, but didn't respond. On Monday morning... Before I left for school, Mom called Mr. Cunningham to let him know that I would do the PSA. After she hung up, she turned to me and said, The good news is, you can still go to Fox Run. I hoisted my backpack onto my shoulders. And the bad news? Mr. Cunningham said Holly will probably call this afternoon to discuss when you can get started. Holding back the dramatic sigh I wanted to release, I shook my head. Great. When I got to school, I noticed there were a lot of kids who stood in line at the office. Curious, I walked over to the line and asked what was going on. Oh, hey, Morgan, the boy standing nearest me said. Feeling like a minor celebrity, I smiled. We heard about how you can opt out of their stupid monthly weigh-in, so we're in line to turn in our forms. My smile grew. That's great. Even as I stood there, the line got longer. Several kids smiled at me or said hello, and I felt proud that I had something to do with this. Then I remembered the PSA I would be doing, and my smile faltered. At lunch, I sat with Billy and Rochelle. A ton of kids are turning in the opt-out form, Rochelle said, her eyes shining. Thanks to all of your hard work, I said. 
A blush rose on her cheeks. It's not just me, Morgan. It was your idea. I smiled and nodded, but inside, I wondered what everyone would think when they saw the PSA that I would be doing, and I worried what Holly would have me say. Did you decide? Billy asked, evidently reading my mind. About doing the PSA? What PSA? Rochelle asked as she picked up her sandwich. I told her about the principal's ultimatum. I don't see that I have much of a choice. That totally sucks, Morgan, she said. I know. I glanced at Billy. When she tries to schedule it, I'm going to see if I can put her off. You know, see if she'll lose interest. Billy chuckled softly. You know that's not going to work, don't you? Why not? My brow furrowed. I had no other ideas, so it had to work. This is Holly we're talking about, he said with a tilt of his head. What do you mean? Rochelle asked. Just that she's not one to take no for an answer. Billy directed his comment to Rochelle, then he turned to me with a knowing look. Flashing back to that day in Nick's living room, when Billy, Nick, and I had watched the video I'd recorded when Holly had tortured me, I held back a grimace. Billy was right. Even though the Holly in this world hadn't tortured me, her personality didn't seem to be any different from the Holly who had. When Billy and I finished our last class, we walked to detention together. I wonder how many kids will be there, I said. He shrugged. It's kind of ridiculous that they're even making us do this. I agreed wholeheartedly, but since Mom hadn't challenged it, I didn't see how I had a choice. We were meeting in one of the oversized rooms, and as we walked in, I saw that the classroom was nearly full. Hey, Rochelle said when we sat in chairs near hers. No talking, the teacher at the front of the room said. You may work on homework or read a book, but nothing else. Phones are to be put away at all times or I will confiscate them. Anyone who had a phone out quickly put it away. This is a room you'll be in all week, the teacher said. You are to sign in when you arrive. Do not try to go to another one of the detention rooms or you won't get credit for being there. How many rooms were being used? Then I remember the principal saying that 20% of the students had refused to be weighed. A smile blossomed on my face. At least we got some homework done, Billy said, as we left detention an hour later. Yeah, but it was much more fun when Billy and I were able to sit by ourselves and work on our homework together. We climbed into Rochelle's car, and I was grateful she was willing to drive us home. Otherwise, I would either have to walk or have Mom pick me up. No buses came this late after school. As we pulled out of the student parking lot and drove past the main parking lot, a car parked in the main lot caught my eye. Something about it looked familiar, but I couldn't place it. My thoughts turned to Holly and when she would want to start shooting the PSA, and all thoughts of the car left my mind. Do you want to come in? I asked both Billy and Rochelle when we arrived at my house. Sure, Billy said. I can't, Rochelle said. I promised my mom I'd help her with some stuff. Billy and I told Rochelle goodbye, then we went into my house. The moment we walked in, Amy hurried to me with a bright smile. Holly called. She handed me a slip of paper. She wants you to call her back. She paused. Do you think I can do the commercial with you? I didn't want to do it at all, but maybe if Amy was there too, I could avoid having to say anything that I would really object to. Not that I wanted my younger sister to have to say anything I didn't like, but at least no one would call her a hypocrite. I'll see what I can do, I said. Awesome! She dashed out of the room, leaving Billy and me alone. I know what you're doing, Billy said. What? You're trying to get Amy to take your place doing the PSA, right? I grinned. The thought had crossed my mind. He laughed. For some reason, and I think I know what it is, Holly wants you to do it. Oh yeah? Why does she want me to do it so badly? Because everyone saw you arguing with her, and she probably thinks that if you do a PSA, then that will neutralize what you were trying to say. I hadn't thought of that, but it made sense and it made me even more determined to avoid doing it at all. To emphasize my decision, I wadded up the piece of paper with Holly's number and threw it in the trash. Are you hungry? I asked Billy as he watched me with a grin.
Chapter 38. Billy. Morgan made me smile. I had to give her that. Sometimes she did stuff I didn't think was smart, like trusting Jack and Danny and going back into Camp Willamos, but I knew she always had a good reason to do the things she did. I held back a laugh as she firmly closed the cabinet door where she'd thrown Holly's number in the trash. Though she was only postponing the inevitable, I couldn't blame her. I didn't want her moving to another school any more than she did, but I also didn't like that she was being coerced into doing another PSA for the Healthy Lifestyles organization. Yeah, I said, I could eat. She laughed. I think you've put on a few pounds since you came here. I smiled. I knew what she meant. I had gained a few pounds since arriving in her world. It was easy, since I could pretty much eat whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. I'd always been underweight, so the extra calories had been needed, but I still made sure to get enough exercise. Running from Tasco's house to Morgan's usually filled my quota, so I believed I was doing what I should be. Morgan rummaged around in the refrigerator, then handed me an apple. Thanks. I took a bite of the crunchy, sweet fruit. Closing the fridge, she turned to me with a smile. So, what are we going to do about my dad and Tasco? She sunk her teeth into her apple. Why do we have to do anything about them? After swallowing, she said, You know, the whole Slender Bars campaign they're working on. I know what you're talking about. I just don't know why it's up to us to save the world. I paused as I ate another bite of apple. Don't you get tired of being the only person who cares? She sighed. Yes, I do actually, which is why I'm glad I'm not the only person who cares. You do too, right? I gazed at her as I considered her question. I cared, yes, but how much did I care? Morgan seemed to feel much more passionately about what was happening than I did. I guess so. Her eyes widened and her mouth fell open. You guess so? What? Why don't you know so, Billy? Our eyes locked, and as I stared at her, I wondered the same thing. Why didn't I feel as strongly as she did about the school doing these forced weigh-ins, or the government changing the rules regarding what food we would be able to buy at school? Maybe it was because my problem had never been with my weight, but rather with getting food at all. After my parents had kicked me out because they didn't want to have to take care of me, I'd resorted to breaking into the schools at night so I could get enough food to stay alive. I'd only been sent to the fat center as punishment for stealing. It had never been about weight for me. Besides, Morgan was the one at the center of this fight. I'd stayed by her side, and I always would, but it wasn't about me. Look, I finally said, you know I support you, and I'll do whatever I can to help you, but this isn't my fight. Placing her hands on her hips, she shook her head. Then what is your fight, Billy? My fight is was, to stop the government from locking people up in the fat centers. But don't you see? That's exactly where we could be headed. Even though I could see her point, it seemed so far off, and honestly, pretty unlikely, when I looked around and saw how much people valued their freedom to eat whatever, whenever they liked. It was hard to imagine things getting to that point. You don't think it will happen here, do you? I guess anything's possible, I replied. Then I took another bite of the apple. After all, who would have believed there was a parallel universe? She arched her eyebrow. Exactly. Frowning, she gazed at me. Don't you see? It's about government control. With these new initiatives, we can already see that happening. The government is trying to control our behavior and make choices for us. When she put it that way, it seemed much more obvious, and I realized I'd known it all along. I wondered why I hadn't been more proactive, but quickly understood that I'd been too focused on adjusting to, and enjoying, this world and the freedoms it allowed. Freedoms that could potentially slip away if I didn't help to change the direction we were headed. I see what you mean, I said. Morgan smiled. Good. Did you call Holly back? Morgan's mom asked as she came into the kitchen. Morgan frowned. No, and I'm not going to. Morgan, you know you have to talk to her. That was the agreement you made with the principal. I know, but I don't have to talk to her today. Smiling in a knowing way, 
Her mom shook her head, then left us alone. She's right, I said. If you really want to avoid doing the PSA, you're going to have to come up with something better than avoiding talking to Holly. I know, Morgan said. Then she smiled brightly. What if I'm too sick to do it? I laughed. That will work for a few days, but eventually you'll either have to die or get better. Morgan groaned. This really sucks. Chapter 39 Morgan That evening after Billy had gone home, the phone rang. Thinking it was him, I picked it up on the second ring. Hello? Hello, Morgan, Holly said. I squeezed my eyes closed as I silently berated myself for letting my guard down. Hey! All the enthusiasm left my voice as I opened my eyes and stared at the counter. A stray crumb caught my eye and I brushed it into the sink. I think it's terrific that you've agreed to do another PSA, and I'm eager to get started right away. I'll bet you are, I thought. Yeah, I said, so I was wondering if Amy could be in this one too. Ah, uh, I'm afraid the script just calls for one person, so not this time. Holly's voice brightened. But I'm sure we can use her in a future PSA. She did a great job before. Maybe she should do it instead of me, I said. You know, since she's so good at it. Holly laughed. No, this spot was created especially for you, Morgan. I pursed my lips and shook my head. Billy was right. She was going to make me pay for speaking out against her especially since it was on the news. Holding back a sigh, I readied my excuse as to why I would need to postpone starting. The script is ready to go, she said, so I'd like to start right away. What's your schedule like this week? Besides detention for refusing to do your stupid weigh-in, it's wide open, I thought. Uh, I have plans this week. Oh, that's too bad. Hmm, I suppose we can start on Saturday. The I have plans this week excuse had worked so well, I decided to try it again. You know, I said, doing this PSA was kind of last minute. I'm kind of booked up for the next little while. Holly laughed, but it rang with irritation. This is important, Morgan. You'll just have to squeeze me into your busy schedule. Not likely, I thought. I'll have to get back to you, Holly. I was in control this time, and I liked the way it felt. Don't take too long, Morgan. Okay, I'll call you when I find an opening in my schedule. All right, goodbye then. Bye. I hung up, and it felt like a small weight had been lifted from my mind. Who was that? Amy asked. I studied her earnest face and felt bad about the news I was about to deliver. It was Holly. Oh. Her eyes glowed with excitement. What did she say? Can I be in the PSA? I smiled gently. I asked her if you could, and she said you did a great job, but she said this time the script calls for just one person. Disappointment replaced the excitement. Oh. Desperately wishing Amy could take my place, I put a hand on her shoulder. Holly said you could probably be in the next one, though. Hope swept away the disappointment. Really? She said that? Yes, she really did. Awesome! Thanks, Morgan! With any luck, the whole PSA thing would magically disappear, and neither one of us would have to do it. But at least Amy was happy again. You're welcome. What's going on? Mom asked as she joined us. I get to be in a PSA, Amy said. Not this one, she quickly amended. This one is just Morgan's, but maybe the one after that. Oh? Mom looked at me. Was that Holly on the phone? I nodded. When do you start? Uh, I told her I'd get back to her. Mom's forehead creased. And she accepted that? Don't you want to do it? Amy asked, obviously confused as to how that could possibly be. Not really, I said in answer to both Mom and Amy. Why not? Amy asked. The corners of my lips lifted in a smile, but I couldn't maintain it. It's kind of complicated. Oh. Don't you have a book report to write? Mom asked Amy. Yeah. I watched her trudge out of the room. Then I faced Mom. What are you doing? She asked. Trying to avoid doing this stupid PSA. Mom smiled. That's obvious. 
but eventually you're going to have to do it. I know, but why can't I postpone it as long as possible? Why not just get it over with? Because once I do it, it will be on TV, I grimaced. That's what I'm trying to avoid. I see. She studied me. I know you feel strongly about the message they're putting out, Morgan, strongly against it. She paused. Maybe you made the wrong choice in agreeing to do the PSA. She smiled, gently ran her finger along my face, then turned and left the room. Had I made the wrong choice? Should I have chosen to change schools? But how could that be the right choice? The thought of moving to a school where I didn't know anyone, where Billy wouldn't be, made my heart pound in fear. Agreeing to do the PSA was the easier choice especially if I could actually avoid doing it. By Wednesday morning, I hadn't heard from Holly, and I hoped she would lose interest in me and find someone else to do her PSA. As I walked to the detention room that afternoon, I heard some kids behind me grumbling about wasting their time and how they were just going to do the weigh-ins the next month. I stopped and turned to the kids. Why not just opt out? My parents wouldn't sign the form, one boy said. Mine either, another boy said. Mine signed it, the girl with them said with a smile. I'm not going to do detention again, the first boy said. I'd rather just do the stupid weigh-ins. It takes like ten seconds. Detention is taking hours. Though I could see his point, I also thought he was missing the whole idea of refusing. But don't you think it's wrong that they're making us get weighed in the first place? Are you saying that you're willing to go to detention every month? the second boy asked. If I had to, yeah. Did your parents sign the opt-out form? The girl asked me. Almost reluctantly, I nodded. There you go, the first boy said. You won't have to go to detention or be weighed, so it's easy for you to say that. It wasn't easy at all. They had no idea the dilemma I found myself in. Either do the PSA or change schools. That was a much harder choice than whether or not to go to detention but I couldn't tell them that. They probably didn't care anyway. Guess you have to do what you think is right, I said. Then I turned around and continued walking to the detention room. Billy and Rochelle were already there, so I sat by them after I signed in. We didn't speak, but just pulled out our homework. When we were dismissed, the three of us walked out of the school and toward Rochelle's car. I'll be glad when this week's over, Rochelle said, as she turned on the engine and backed out of her space. I know, Billy said from the back seat. I hate sitting there and not being able to say anything. At least at Camp Willemas they let us talk. My head whipped in his direction, and when our eyes met, his were wide, like he just realized what he'd said. Camp Willemas? Rochelle asked, glancing at him in the rearview mirror. What's that? Uh, it's, uh, this place I went one summer. What did you do there? You know, he stammered, regular stuff. Oh, Morgan, he said, are you still coming over to my house today? Uh, yeah. We hadn't made any plans for me to come over, but I played along. We can work on that paper for health class. Great. Rochelle didn't ask any other questions about Camp Willemas, and a few minutes later, we pulled up to Tasco's house. Thanks for the ride, I said to Rochelle. No problem, she said. We said our goodbyes, then went into Tasco's house. Billy threw his backpack to the floor. I can't believe I said that. It's okay. As far as she knows, it's just some summer camp you went to. It's not a big deal. He shook his head. I've gotten too comfortable here, and I let my guard down. I went to the front window and stared out at the chilly January afternoon, hoping I was right and that Rochelle wouldn't push to find out anything else about Camp Willemas. My gaze roved the neighborhood, at least as far as I could see from where I stood. There wasn't much activity, so when a white car turned onto Billy's street and slowed as it passed his house, I took notice. I couldn't make out the driver, but I could see there was no one else in the car besides the driver. Narrowing my eyes, I thought it looked like the same car I'd seen in the school's main parking lot on Monday afternoon. I watched it slowly cruise down the street until it was out of sight. Once it was out of my view, it hit me, and I knew where I'd seen the car before. It was the same car I'd seen parked in front of Billy's parents' house, and then again at the cemetery, 
It looked just like the car Billy's parents drove. Chapter 40 Morgan I turned from the window. Billy was sitting on the bottom step of the staircase, his head in his hands. Could that have been his mom or dad? I looked out the window again, willing the car to come back so I could get a better look, but the street stayed empty. I must be mistaken. I mean, there are a lot of white Toyota Corollas around. It could have been anybody. But it was strange how it seemed to slow down when it passed Tasco's house. Unsure if it was worth mentioning, I looked at Billy. Obviously distressed by what he'd accidentally said in front of Rochelle, he didn't seem up to hearing my report that a car that may look like his parents had driven by. Not when it could have been anybody. Besides, how would they know where Billy lived? No, there was no reason to give him something new to stress over. I hurried to his side and sat next to him on the step, then put my arm around his shoulder. Forget it, Billy. She's not going to care about some summer camp you went to years ago. He looked at me and a small smile lifted the corners of his mouth. I hope you're right. I grinned. I'm always right. He laughed. That's debatable. At least I'd gotten him to think of something besides what he'd said. I'm hungry. Does Tasco have anything good to eat? He stood, then held out his hand. I let him pull me to my feet. Rather than letting go, he pulled me against him, wrapping his arms around me. His strong arms made me feel safe and protected. Even though I knew he wasn't perfect, I knew he would always stand by me. He'd already proven that. You always know just what to say, he murmured next to my ear. I smiled, glad I'd been able to convince him that mentioning Camp Willowmoss to Rochelle wasn't the end of the world. He drew away from me, gazed into my eyes, then pressed his lips to mine. One of his arms stayed around my waist, while one hand went to the back of my neck. I melted into his kiss, relishing the feel of his lips against mine as my arms snaked around his neck. My cell phone rang in my pocket, and I jumped back like I'd been caught doing something I shouldn't. At the surprised look on Billy's face, I started laughing as I swiped my phone to answer. Hello? Where are you, Morgan? Mom asked. I just got to Billy's house. I didn't know you were going there. Oh, well, it was kind of a last-minute decision. Hmm, next time I'd like to know your plans. I'm sorry, Mom. The reason I called, besides to find out where you are, is to let you know that I spoke to Holly. Did she call you? Yes. She wasn't happy that you hadn't called her back yet. She said that you're holding up production of the PSA, and she insisted that you start as soon as possible. Mom paused. Morgan, when she pressed me about you starting on Saturday, I had to admit that you were available. Mom! My tone of voice showed that I didn't approve. She sighed. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to lie to her. Besides, you agreed to do the PSA, so you're going to have to do it. Of course she was right. Fine. We hung up, and I turned to Billy with a scowl. I'm doing the PSA on Saturday. Do you want me to come with you? The thought of having Billy there for moral support boosted my mood. Yes, that would be great. He smiled. Good. Saturday morning, Mom and I picked Billy up, and the three of us drove to the studio where we'd filmed the first PSA. You don't have to stay, I told Mom as she parked, remembering how many hours Amy and I had been there before. Are you sure? Yeah, I have Billy here, so I'll be fine. I smiled at Billy as he took my hand in his. Mom smiled at Billy. Okay, let me just see if I need to sign a release or anything. The foyer seemed pretty empty as we walked in, so when Holly walked through a side door to meet us, my eyes went right to her. Good morning, she gushed as she walked toward us. I'm so glad you could make it today, Morgan. Billy gently squeezed my hand and I forced a smile. Hi. Roxanne, Holly said to Mom. Thanks for arranging this. I'm not planning on staying, Mom said, 
but I wanted to see if you need anything from me before I leave. No, I think we're all set. Mom pulled me into a hug. Try to have fun, Morgan, she murmured in my ear before pulling back and giving me a look that said to behave myself. I will. Although I knew I would be completely miserable, there was no fun involved. I watched her leave and wished I could go with her. Okay then, Holly said. Let's get started. Billy and I followed Holly to the space where we'd filmed the first PSA. You know the drill, Holly said, as she motioned to the makeup chair. Here's the script. I took it from her and sat in the makeup chair. Billy stood nearby as the makeup and hair people got started. Holding the script in front of me, I managed to read it despite the fact that the makeup lady kept getting in the way. The script said that I would say my lines while standing in front of a blue screen where images of healthy foods being harvested would be projected. As I read the words I would have to say, my stomach began to churn. There was no way I could say what Holly wanted me to say. I read it over again. We live in a country where food is abundant, but that has challenges of its own. Sometimes we have so many options that it's hard to know what to choose. The new food choice regulations in our schools will take the guesswork out of the equation. Starting this fall, only the healthiest foods will be available at our schools. My name is Morgan Campbell, and I believe that a healthy me is a healthy world. My mind screamed in rebellion. I can't do this. No, no, no. The makeup and hair people finished, but I stayed where I was. Are you okay? Billy asked. I handed him the script. I can't say this. He read it over, then looked at me with a frown. All set, Holly said as she appeared next to my chair. When I looked at her fake smile, I actually felt a jolt in my neck as if she'd pressed the torture device. I cringed. Though the spot at the base of my skull had healed long ago, my hand automatically reached for it as my gaze went to Billy. I saw the worried look on his face and knew he knew what I was remembering. Billy moved to stand in front of me, then he placed his hands on my shoulders and leaned in like he was giving me a hug. They're just words, Morgan, he whispered. You can do it. It was that last line that really bothered me. There was no way I could get those words past my teeth. Come on, Holly said. Time to get started. Billy held his hand out. I grasped it and let him help me out of my chair. But once my feet touched the floor, I didn't want to let go. I want Billy to be in it with me, I said. No, he said without hesitation. You know I can't do that. No, Holly said at the same time. This is just for you, Morgan. Maybe I could change the last line. Maybe Holly wouldn't even notice. Everyone was looking at me. Billy, Holly, the camera crew, the lighting people, everyone. Okay, I said, resigned to my fate. Let's get this over with. Terrific, Holly said with a grin. She walked over to a taped X on the floor. You'll stand here, Morgan, and say your lines. We have the cue cards again. Great, I mumbled. Then I forced my legs to carry me to the X. X marks the spot, I whispered, and held back a laugh. I'd gone from being dragged out of my house and into a federally assisted thinning center to escaping with Billy to voluntarily going back inside so I could help Amy escape, to being discovered and taken to a higher security facility, to being tortured by Holly, to getting away from Holly, and finally getting back to my world. Surely I could manage to say a few words telling people how wonderful it was to have the government make their food choices for them. The similarities between Billy's world and mine were startling, and I suddenly found it hard to breathe. Bending at the waist, I put my hands on my knees and took several deep breaths. Are you okay, Morgan? Holly called out. We need to begin now. I didn't care what she needed, and when I felt a hand on my back, I nearly elbowed the person who had put it there. Then I heard Billy's voice. I'm right here with you. It will be okay. I turned my head and saw Billy standing next to me. I remembered how we'd cut the tracking chips out of each other's arms and then barely managed to escape Camp Willamos. 
I'd had to stab Enforcer Hansen in the back to get him to release Billy, but we'd gotten away and found Jack and Danny's group. All of my time in Billy's world rushed through my mind, and I knew, I knew, I couldn't be a shill in Holly's propaganda. Billy stepped away, and I slowly stood. Action, Holly said. I stared at the cue card, but my mouth seemed frozen. No words would come out. Everyone's eyes were on me, and the room was completely silent as everyone waited for me to speak. My focus went to Holly. Her mouth was pressed into a thin line. Cut, she shouted. Then she stormed over to me. What's going on, Morgan? Why aren't you saying your lines? I can't. You can't or you won't, she said, cutting me off. With her hands on her hips, she glared at me. You made an agreement. This or go to another school. Is that what you want, Morgan? To leave Fox Run and attend a new school where you don't know anyone? Huh? Is that what you want? What is your problem? I said as I faced her head on, my hands on my hips and my eyes narrowed with rage. What is it with you wanting me to do this? What's so special about me, huh? She glared. Nothing special about you, Morgan. Nothing. Then have someone else say your stupid lines, I yelled. Then I marched over to Billy. Let's go. His eyebrows rose. We're leaving? I grabbed his hand. Yes. He smiled like that was the best idea he'd ever heard. Okay. Hand in hand, we walked out of the room, out of the studio, and out into the chilly January air. Chapter 41. Morgan. The moment we cleared the parking lot, I began breathing hard as the adrenaline seeped away. I'm so screwed, I murmured. So screwed. Don't panic, Billy said. I'm right here. I looked at him. Our eyes met, and I threw my arms around him. I'm so glad you're here. He pulled me against him, and with a low chuckle, he said, I've always been there when you've needed me the most. The truth of his statement hit me, and I held him tighter. I know, and I love you for it. What? he said as he pulled away. His eyes sparkled, and his smile stretched from ear to ear. What did you say? My smile matched his, and I knew I'd been thinking it for a while. Now it felt right to say it out loud. I said, I love you, Billy Foster. Placing both of his hands on my face, he laughed. I love you, Morgan Campbell. You do? My horrible morning had just turned into one of the best days of my life. He grinned. Are you really so surprised? We'd been through so much together, and now we'd said how we really felt. It was wonderful. It's gonna suck when you don't go to Fox Run, he said. It was as if my heart dropped right out of my chest. I'd briefly forgotten the consequences of running out of Holly Studio, but at Billy's words, the reality came roaring back. Come on, he said. Let's call your mom to come get us. I can't, I said. I don't want her to know yet. It's a little far to walk, he grinned. Even for me. What about Rochelle? I said. I'll call her. Billy shrugged. Okay. A few minutes later, I'd arranged with Rochelle to come pick us up, telling her that I would explain when she got here. What is this place? Rochelle asked as we climbed into her car, me in the passenger seat, Billy in back. I grimaced. The place where I just screwed myself over. What? She looked at Billy for an explanation. It's where Holly was shooting the PSA, he said. Then he smiled. And right in the middle of it, Morgan basically told Holly to get someone else to be her flunky. Rochelle smiled. That's awesome, Morgan. Once we were belted in, she asked where we wanted her to take us. Thank you so much for coming to get us, I said, but I don't want to go home. My mom's going to be mad at me. Tasco's kid is at his house this weekend, Billy said so I don't really want to go there. It's too early to go to the mall, Rochelle said. We can go to my house. Turning to her with a smile, I said, Great idea. When we turned onto her street, deja vu flooded me. The last time I'd seen this street, I'd been in the other world, and I hadn't known what was going on. 
We passed her neighbor's house, the woman who had invited me in when I'd knocked on her door, and then had called someone to say I was telling crazy stories. Rochelle pulled up to the curb at her house. When we walked inside, I immediately recognized the layout of her house, although the furniture was slightly different. Remembering the orange tabby who'd snuggled against me as I slept in Rochelle's parents' closet, I asked, "'Where's your cat?' "'My cat?' She looked at me with confusion. "'I don't have a cat.' I laughed self-consciously. "'I guess I thought you'd said you did.' With a look that said I must be going nuts, I pressed my hands to my head. "'Too much going on, I guess.' She laughed. "'Yeah, I guess so.' Her mother came into the room. A woman I'd never seen before. Rochelle introduced us, then said, "'My room's this way.' We followed her down the familiar hallway and into her room. Taking a deep breath to center myself, I sat on her bed and focused on the here and now. Rochelle sat in her desk chair. "'Tell me exactly what happened, Morgan.' Billy sat beside me, and I held tightly to his hand as I told Rochelle about my interaction with Holly. "'That is so awesome,' Rochelle said. I frowned. "'Not completely awesome. Now I'll have to switch schools.' "'Maybe that was an empty threat,' she said. "'I mean, can Mr. Cunningham really even do that?' I glanced at Billy as if he would have any idea, then turned back to Rochelle. It didn't seem like an empty threat. My cell phone rang. I took it out of my pocket and looked at the screen. "'It's my mom.' So far, having the cell phone had been more trouble than it was worth, enabling mom to find me when I didn't necessarily want to be found." I released Billy's hand so I could swipe the screen to answer. Hello? What is going on? Mom asked. Where are you? I'm at Rochelle's. My eyes went from Rochelle to Billy. Why aren't you at the studio doing the PSA? Since you wouldn't have called in the middle of filming, she obviously knew I'd bailed on Holly. I couldn't do it, Mom. I tried. I really tried. But I couldn't say what she wanted me to say. Look, she said. I understand how difficult it must be, but you made a commitment and you need to keep it. Squeezing my eyes closed, I thought about my decision to do the PSA. Why had I ever thought I could go through with it? But I knew why, because I'd hoped I could get out of it. I made a mistake, okay? I said as I opened my eyes. I should never have agreed to do it in the first place. My voice became firm. I know I told Holly I would do it, but I just can't. I can't do their propaganda. Mom was quiet. Then she said, What are you going to do now? Billy slid his fingers back into mine, and I felt a surge of warmth in my heart. No matter what, I had Billy and my family. So really, what else mattered? I don't know, I said. I guess I'll have to see if Mr. Cunningham really makes me leave Fox Run. You should know that Holly asked Amy to fill in for you today. What? They'd already paid to use the space and to hire the crew, so they didn't want to waste it. She's doing it? I didn't like the idea of my sister being a shill in their propaganda machine either, although I knew she would be thrilled to do it. Yes, Mom said. Dad's taking her there now. It was out of my hands. The PSA would be made with or without me. You need to come home. Dad was pretty upset that you ran out on Holly like that. I think he'll want to talk to you. She paused. Do you need me to come get you? I knew she would have to stop whatever she and the boys were doing to come get me, and I didn't want to make her life any more difficult. No, that's okay. Good, because I'm about to take Zack to a soccer game. I'm sorry, I said, though I wasn't exactly sure what I was apologizing for. I know, honey. See you when you get home. Bye. I ended the call, then looked at Billy. I have to go home. "'What'd your mom say?' Rochelle asked. "'Was she mad?' I couldn't begin to explain to Rochelle how even though Mom wasn't happy with me, she understood, not without telling her about the parallel world I'd visited. "'She was kind of mad,' I said, "'but she'll get over it. "'Do you want me to take you home?' "'You've been so nice to drive us everywhere,' I said with a smile. "'But we can get ourselves home. "'You're my friend, Morgan. "'I'm glad to be able to help you out.' Then her face lit up. Besides, I like to have an excuse to drive. I laughed. Hopefully I'll get my driver's license one of these days. But really, you don't need to give us a ride. A short time later, 
Billy and I were walking hand in hand away from Rochelle's house. Do you know how to get home from here? He asked, doubt clear on his face. I chuckled at his expression. I know I have no sense of direction, but believe it or not, I'm kind of familiar with this area. I spent some time here when I first arrived in your world when I was looking for my family. Okay, then I guess I'm safe in your hands. Yes, you are. What did your mom really say? She understood, and she said Amy is doing the PSA in my place. I'll bet Amy was happy about that. I'm sure she was, but my mom said my dad was mad at me for running out. Billy frowned. Then he must not really believe our story. Between Dad's attitude over the Slender Bars ad campaign and the fact that he was mad that I didn't go through with the PSA, it sure seemed that way. I think you're right, I said. We were quiet as we walked, and I thought about the car I'd seen at school and that had driven past Billy's house. Billy had a right to know. Billy, I have to tell you something. Chapter 42 Billy The tone of Morgan's voice got my attention. Worry, guilt, and fear all conveyed in one sentence. What's wrong? I asked as I appraised her, the girl I declared my love for that very day. The memory made me smile, but the look on her face brought on a feeling of apprehension. I saw a car, she said. I glanced around and for half a second it felt like we were back in my world, on the run from the enforcers. Where? Not here. At the school, and at your house. Frustration swept over me. I have no idea what you're talking about, Morgan. She sighed. Okay. On Monday after school, when we were leaving, I saw a car in the school parking lot that looked familiar, and then on Wednesday I saw it again, driving past your house. What car? What looked familiar about it? It was a white Toyota Corolla. She stared at me like she expected me to know the significance of her statement, and then I did. Was it my parents? Were they in the car? My heart thumped painfully in my chest. I wasn't sure if it was from excitement that my parents were trying to find me, or if it was from terror that they would find me. I couldn't see who was driving, but there was only the driver in the car, at least when it drove by her house. And Billy... She paused. The car slowed down when it went past your house. Are you sure? This wasn't something I wanted to speculate about. It was too important. Are you sure it was them? She shook her head. No, that's the problem. That's why I didn't say anything before. I mean, it's a white car. There are tons of those around. What was she doing to me? Then why tell me? I mean, if there are so many of them out there, what made you even notice that car... Well, she said as she considered my question, I guess it just caught my eye. I mean, there weren't that many cars in the parking lot at school on Monday afternoon since it was after detention, but the thing that really made me pay attention was when I saw what looked like the same car drive past your house right after we got there on Wednesday. And then, when it seemed to slow down as it passed your house, she shrugged. I just thought you should know, that's all. There was so much uncertainty in what she had seen that I half wished she hadn't told me. For one thing, there was nothing I could do about it. For another, I had no way to verify for myself what she'd seen. And even if I could, then what? Thanks for telling me. I should have told you sooner. That's okay. I mean, there's not much to tell. It could have been anyone, really. And I kind of hoped it was. Anyone but my parents, that is. What would it mean if they were trying to find me? What would be going through their minds? They'd buried their son a few months ago. Who was I to them? We'll have to catch the bus to get to my house, Morgan said as we walked through the downtown area. We sat on the bench next to the bus stop, and as we waited, we talked about things other than PSAs, alternate worlds, government control, and my parents maybe trying to find me. When we got to Morgan's house, no one was home. I guess Amy and my dad are still with Holly, and my mom must be at the boys' soccer game. Morgan fixed us something to eat, and when Amy and her dad got home, Amy's face was flushed, and she wore a huge smile. I'm in another commercial, she sang out as she danced toward us. That's great, Morgan said, but I could tell by the tone of her voice that she didn't mean it. It was pretty embarrassing to have to face Holly, her dad said. 
Luckily, she's a professional, and she went on with Amy without missing a beat. Like I told Mom, Morgan said, I'm really sorry. I should never have agreed to do the PSA in the first place. No, her dad said. You shouldn't have. It makes you look bad, and by extension, it makes your mother and me look bad. Morgan's shoulders sagged, and I knew she felt terrible about this. I'd been there. I'd seen the way she'd frozen. I knew she wasn't faking it or trying to get attention or anything like that. She truly believed in what she was doing. I admired her for standing by her principles. Well, it worked out for me, Amy said, her face practically glowing. I have to call Cassie. Then she left Morgan, her dad, and me alone. Morgan's dad turned to me. I understand you were there, Billy. He glanced at Morgan before settling his gaze on me. What happened? I regarded Morgan, hoping to get her approval, but she was staring at the floor. It's not her fault, I said. She was all set to do it, but she couldn't say those things. I looked at her dad with intensity. After what she went through, how could anyone say those things? His eyebrows pulled together. Sometimes we have to do things even if we don't want to. And sometimes we have to stand up for what we believe in, Morgan said, her focus on her dad. Isn't that what you taught me? His eyes met hers. Yes, of course. They stared at each other, but her dad looked away first. I have work to do. Thanks for defending me, Morgan said to me after her dad walked away. Glad she wasn't mad at me, I smiled. I just told the truth. Yeah, well, sometimes he has to hear it from someone besides me. When school got out on Monday, I walked out of the building with Morgan, all the while keeping an eye out for the white car that she'd seen twice the week before. Even as we boarded the bus and left the parking lot, I studied every car in the area, on high alert for anyone who looked even vaguely like my parents. Are you okay? Morgan asked as she touched my arm, making me jump. Yeah, I said, barely glancing at her, my gaze glued to the window. Just looking for... I glanced at her again. A certain white car. Oh. Her head swiveled toward the window. Good idea. We made it to my stop without seeing any suspicious cars. We both got off and went into Tasco's house. I dropped my backpack on the floor and went right to the window, keeping watch. Morgan stood next to me. Is Tasco still working on that Slender Bars campaign? As far as I know, I laughed. After I told him how much I hate power bars, he hasn't asked me to look at his progress, though. I turned to her. What about your dad? Yeah, he's still working on it, too. I guess they have a presentation to the president of the company in a couple of days. He seems kind of stressed about it. I went back to staring out the window. So, you haven't heard anything about switching to another school? Not yet. Tasco Street wasn't very busy, and after a while, I was ready to give up watching for a white car that may or may not drive by. Chapter 43 Morgan Watching Billy obsess over any and all cars that passed his house made me regret telling him about the car I'd seen. It was probably nothing, and now he was worrying about it. Let's do something else, I said. He turned to me with a smirk. You mean besides staring at my street? I laughed. Yeah, I have homework to do. Even if I was going to have to change schools, and the thought terrified me, I didn't want to take a chance on getting behind on my homework. What if Mr. Cunningham relented and let me stay? I wanted to prove I was a good student. Settling onto the couch, we pulled out our books, then got to work. Half an hour later, someone knocked on the front door. Eyes wide, Billy looked at me, then got up and walked toward the door. I jumped up and followed him, curious who it could be. My mom stood on the porch. Mom? Morgan, she said, looking around Billy's shoulder. Mr. Cunningham called and asked that we meet with him right away. My heart started to pound. This was it. He was going to make me leave Fox Run. Did he say why? Dismay filled her eyes. I think we both know why. My hand automatically sought Billy's, and his fingers intertwined with mine. Get your stuff and come with me, she said. I knew I had no choice. 
I'd already made my choice when I ran out on Holly at Saturday's filming. Without a word, I went back into the living room and gathered my books. Billy and Mom followed me. Maybe you can talk him out of it, Billy said. I zipped up my backpack and hoisted it over my shoulder. You know he won't agree. It's worth a try, Mom said. I gave her a half-hearted smile, then turned to Billy. I'll call you later. Okay. After giving me a hug, he released me. You have to do what you think is right. I nodded, then followed Mom out to her car. What about Dad? I asked as we drove toward the school. Shouldn't he be here? He couldn't get away from work. Mom glanced at me. He's getting ready for that big presentation, you know. Yeah, I know. Ten minutes later, we walked into Mr. Cunningham's office. Mrs. Campbell, he said with a smile, please come in. Ignoring me as I sat next to Mom in one of the chairs by his desk, Mr. Cunningham sat in his chair. I think we all know what we're here to discuss. He finally looked at me. I'm very disappointed that you didn't follow through on doing the PSA, Morgan. Sure you are, I thought. Now you'll have an excuse to kick me out of your school and make me someone else's problem. Regardless, he went on, there are consequences. Mr. Cunningham, Mom said, I feel very strongly that it would be in Morgan's best interest for her to continue attending school here, and I know we all want to do what is in Morgan's best interest. Good one, Mom, I thought. But when I looked at the principal's face, his lips had puckered as if he'd smelled something sour. Clearly, he wanted to do what was in his best interest. I understand, Mrs. Campbell. However, arrangements have already been made. Morgan will begin attending Brightwood High School starting tomorrow. What? I cried out, not able to believe things were moving this quickly. Mom placed her hand on my arm as she focused on Mr. Cunningham. I want you to know that my husband and I strongly object to this. I understand, Mrs. Campbell. Nevertheless, Morgan had a choice, and this is what she ultimately chose. I'll do the stupid PSA, I nearly blurted, but then Billy's words came to mind. You have to do what you think is right. As difficult as it would be to change schools, I couldn't support the message of the PSAs that Holly's group were doing. It's fine, I said, surprising everyone, including myself. To emphasize that this wasn't hurting me, I added, it's no big deal. In fact, it will be a chance for me to meet more people. And then I thought, and get their support to end the government control. Unexpected as it was, I suddenly really liked the idea of switching schools. It would give me a new place to preach my message. I turned to Mom with a smile, and it was genuine. I just need to get my stuff out of my locker. Wait a minute, she said. Then she looked at Mr. Cunningham. How is Morgan supposed to get to this school? It's twenty minutes from our house. That will be up to you, Mrs. Campbell. Mom sighed, obviously feeling defeated. Now, he said, I have to tell you that at the end of this school year, you can apply to return to Fox Run. Unless I like it better at Brightwood, I said. Of course, he agreed. Then he looked at Mom. You'll just need to check her in at the office in the morning and the staff will take it from there. It didn't take long for me to clean out my locker and after dropping my textbooks off with Mr. Cunningham, Mom and I headed home. Why the change of heart? Mom asked. Wouldn't you rather stay at Fox Run? Well, yeah, but I'm trying to look at the positive side of things. At Brightwood, I'll be able to tell more kids to opt out of the monthly weigh-ins. You know, get more support. Huh. Mom turned to me with a smile. You're becoming quite the activist. You're just noticing now? She laughed. No, but it just seems more apparent. She paused. I'm proud of you, sweetheart. Thanks. Her words of praise boosted me even more, and I found myself looking forward to the next day. Dad was less supportive of my positive attitude. How can you be so casual about this, Morgan? He asked. First, you don't follow through on your commitment to do the PSA, and now you act like it's no big deal to change to a different school. A school that your mother will have to drive you to each day and pick you up. That's going to be a real inconvenience for her. Steve, Mom said in a calm voice, it's okay. He frowned at her. No, it's not. She's been selfish, and now you're paying the price. I tried to do the PSA, I said, wanting to defend myself. 
but I couldn't spout their message in good conscience. Dad stared at me with a look that said he was trying to understand me. I just hope you can make it work at this school. His eyes narrowed. I don't want to have to go through this again at your new school. Neither do I, and I meant it. I would give myself a little time to fly under the radar before I started telling people about the opt-out. After Dad finished his lecture, I called Billy. So it's really happening, he asked. Looks like it. At least it's better than being locked up in Camp Willamoss, he laughed. Some people might think you were getting off easy. Yeah, if they lived in your world, I said with a frown. We talked for a while longer, with me promising to call him the moment I got home the next day. This has been Dare to Oppose Part 3, Parallel World, Book 4, written and narrated by Christine Kersey. Copyright 2014 by Christine Kersey. Billy and Morgan's story continues in Dare to Oppose Part 4.